Most of us are aware of the gender pay gap, but did you know that gap also extends to startup funding? Yes, it does. There's a lot of research showing just how much gender can influence the success of new ventures. In 2020, startups founded solely by women received 2.3% of global venture capital funds. 2.3%. And the racial pay gap extends here as well. Black and Latina women founders only received less than half a percent of those funds. The numbers are paltry. So while organizations have focused some attention on reducing the gender pay gap in the corporate world, what do we need to do to close the funding gap for women-led startups so that there's greater equity in the entrepreneurship process? I'm Madhup Akinola. This is TED Business. Our speaker today is Temi Giwatubosun, the founder and CEO of LifeBank, a Nigerian company that delivers life-saving medical supplies to remote areas in Africa. In this talk, Temi shares the obstacles she faced in getting funding for her own company and celebrates all the milestones she accomplished in spite of these barriers. She also highlights several female founders who are blazing trails and urges investors to pay attention to their biases when choosing startups to support. Then after the talk, I'll share some more information on women-led startups and discuss a small change during pitches to VCs that could make a big difference in terms of who gets funded. But first, a quick break. In Africa, 39.6% of all Ugandans who start, own, and operate their own businesses are women. Ugandan women are clearly formidable, but they are not alone. The second and third country on that list of world female entrepreneurs, according to MasterCard, were Botswana and Ghana. Yep, Africa. So what's keeping these amazing businesses from dominating global stock exchange? Why are you not seeing people like me, yours truly, listing our companies every day, dominating NASDAQ and London Stock Exchange. Let me tell you what I think. I love the Eros journey. I could often be found on Reddit late into the night after I've put the children to bed, arguing about many fantastical worlds. And I'm always secretly delighted that the people on the other side of the screen could never guess that the fierce figure arguing about middle art canon and the ways of the basilicals in Sotheros is an African mom of two who runs the startup out of Lagos, Nigeria. (laughs) I was born in a small town in Nigeria. In 2001, my parents moved to the United States, where I grew up, got educated, got married, and decided to start a family. It was the difficult birth of my son that started me on my own hero's journey. You see, while I was on bed rest, I found out that 556 women bleed to death every single day across Sub-Saharan Africa. And to my astonishment, if you could just move blood to these hospitals, you could save women. I decided, as a woman who had sat on that hospital bed seven years ago, wondering whether she was going to survive childbirth, that I had a duty to do something about this. I moved back home to Nigeria and started my own company. You see, Africa has the resources. We have the blood, the oxygen, the PPE that we need to save lives, but we don't always have it at the right place at the right time. So that's what we decided to solve. We built technology with over 200,000 lines of code that matches supply to demand and we closed the loop by delivering to the last mile. In 2016, when this company started, we had one single desk at a co-working space. And now, as I speak, we operate across Kenya, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. We can deliver as far as Meiduguri, Bono State, home to the Chibok girls. But no part of this journey was easy. In fact, it almost did not start. 
Because while I recognized the size of the problem, I knew people like me did not start big businesses. There was no playbook. There was no model for me to follow. And I knew that to solve this problem, we would need access to significant amount of resources from venture capital, from philanthropy, and other critical points of growth. But there was a model because people like me had not received the critical resources they needed to grow and scale their own enterprise. So does this mean women cannot be heroes? Does it mean that we cannot be heroes of our own journey? No. In fact, women like me routinely start their own companies. In Nigeria, we have Bilikis Abimbola, who is building the supply chain to get medicine to the last mile. We have Bilikis Abiola, who is protecting our natural world by turning trash to cash. And in Peru, Suli Suecho Diaz is building wealth for families by helping them make better mortgage decisions. Yet, we're not seen as founders that can scale and build large businesses. A few years ago, we needed resources at LifeBank, and I went to pitch LifeBank to an investor. I was very excited, and I told him about all the amazing things we would do. And he said to me, I just can't see you building something that scales. To my face! <laughs> like any normal person, I was taken aback by his lack of faith. But I didn't let that stop me. I felt like I, I was duty-bound to build the change, the innovation that I wanted to see in the world. And although he was right, I don't look like the classic hero. But, like Frodo, the journey chose me. <laughs> so I didn't let that stop me. I went out there and built a great business. And here are a few points. Since inception, we've doubled revenue year on year. We've built technology that can predict oxygen demand, and we use blockchain to track a blood system. These innovations are novel, even by global standards. We have rescued over 40,000 people. Our journey is by no means complete, but watch us pull it off. Truth is, heroes are often not guys in a cape. And my story suggests that we must look to the unexpected places when we're looking for entrepreneurs and leaders. Data suggests that if you hold any kind of bias against the group, you're most likely to discriminate against the people who most need to be heard. And it is these people who often have the solution to the world's most pressing challenges. It is critical that we do the work to listen to every voice and to break down the silos that keep most of us back and keep us from starting. It is time to close the funding gap between female-led startup, black female-led startup, world over. Because while you may not see us, we are here. And there are millions of us. So if you're an investor, I want to invite you to join your peers. And when you're looking for founders to back, look to the unexpected. And if you're in this room, and you think you may want to go on your own hero's quest, I'm here to tell you to do it. And if they don't believe you, show them. The world needs your most unique voice. Thank you. Temi's story is inspirational. And there are so many other women-led startups like hers that are addressing urgent needs. Here are a few that I admire. Samoat Energy is a renewable energy company that provides affordable, off-grid, solar home solutions to families in Somalia. Maya is a startup based in Mali 
that focuses on creating products made with ingredients from local farmers to reduce waste and reliance on imported foods. And how about Asan? In some countries, women can't afford menstrual products, and in others, the products that you can buy are made of materials that are no longer considered safe for women's bodies based on more recent regulations. So Asan, which was launched in India, makes a menstrual cup that is reusable, safe for the body, and can last up to 10 years, reducing the cost of regularly having to buy disposable products. So how can we get more companies like these funded? Temi said something about her experience during pitches that really stood out to me. She would receive comments like, I just can't see you building something that scales. Well, what other types of comments or questions do people get? There's actually evidence that VCs tend to ask male founders promotion-focused questions like, why will you succeed? While female founders are asked prevention-focused questions like, why won't you fail? If investors became committed to asking both groups the same types of questions, that would be a great step toward leveling the playing field for entrepreneurs. And the reason why it's so important to start at the pitch process is that it's almost like a feedback loop. Women don't get the money, so we don't see success stories, and investors are more hesitant to back them, while images of successful male startups are everywhere. Why? Partially because the men get the money and end up doing well, so gender kind of ends up being imprinted in our imagery of what a successful startup looks like. So by changing the pitch process, we're changing the mental models we have of what success in this space looks like. Because the truth is, there are so many problems in this world that need to be fixed, and there are many people out there with companies ready to fix them. It's up to our funders to put systems and processes in place that allow both men and women to have a fair shot. That's it for today. This episode was produced by Kiara Powell and fact-checked by Matias Salas. Special thanks to Anna Phelan, Michelle Quint, Corey Hagem, and Colin Helms. I'm Madhu Paganola. Talk to you again next week.